after having reviewed theories on the causes of migration and theories on the impact of migration and theories on the perpetuation of migration, we are somehow back where we started. And I'm this in this lecture, this last lecture, I'm going to review uh, some theories, but also try to develop a sort of new perspective with how we can look at migration, how we can reframe the way we normally look at migration as part of a broader effort to reconceptualize migration as an intrinsic part of broader processes of development and globalization rather than a problem to be solved, which is the usual take of policies of migration. Now, before starting this lecture, um, it's perhaps useful to re-emphasize that the different theories, for instance, on the cause of migration seem to be highly conflicting and having very different assumptions. But I, the most important sort of thing to, to be aware of is not to feel forced to subscribe to one particular train of thought or one particular paradigm. But it's to be aware that the different theories might have explanatory value if we try to explain migration happening in different situations. For instance, neoclassical migration theory might be very useful to explain a lot of migration taking place in and between wealthy countries where people are relatively, uh, where people face relatively few constraints. Whereas, for instance, the more sort of historical structuralist perspectives or the new economics of labor migration might be much more relevant to explain migration in poor countries or of poor people who face much higher constraints. So it's really to become aware of the context in which migration takes place. And this also leads me to the topic of this lecture, which is about looking at migration as an intrinsic part of broader processes of change. And the core issues I'll address in this lecture are how do development processes and what we call globalization, so the increasing interconnectedness of societies driven by new liberal policies and technological process, processes affect the volume and nature of international migration. And building upon that, what is the relation between economic and demographic transitions and migration patterns and trends? Are they, is there a clear pattern of association between the two of them? Are there any regularities which we can see? And I will argue that we can, but I will also argue that these links are very complex and that the relation between development and migration, the sense of how does development affect migration, is fundamentally non-linear. I will use the term of development often as a shorthand to indicate broader change more in general. And I certainly am not limiting myself to very narrow definitions of development, which only focus on economic growth, for instance. But I'll adopt a much more broader framework, like, for instance, the human development perspective or the capabilities approach. Some people uh, refer to this process as using different terms, like social transformation and globalization. They all mean different things. There are many definitions. And I unfortunately don't have time to go into full detail into those. But it's important to understand that by development, I include a very broad notion of development. Now, there is a sort of background to this whole debate about how does development affect migration, and a sort of policy background, because there is a high public concern on migration of particularly low-skilled migrants from poor countries to Europe and North America, for instance, from North Africa or, or Eastern, um, uh, the former Soviet Union to Europe, and from Latin America to North America. And these type of migration are generally perceived by the public and also narrated by policymakers as a problem in need of control, often in contrast to high-skilled migration. Now, the sort of Pavlov reaction of policymakers is to implement more restrictive policies and border controls. However, what we see is that migration hasn't stopped as such, but has rather changed its face. Now, the theories on network and migration systems on the in internal dynamics are very useful to understand why migrants often defy restrictions because these processes give migration its own momentum. And this enables migrants to defy restrictions. 
In the first lecture, I also reviewed the different substitution effects. So people might might make in, in in response to restrictions, they might start to move to other destinations to jump categories. Uh, it also leads to decreases in return flows, making the effect on net migration ambiguous. But it also may lead to so-called intertemporal substitution effects, like now or never or beat the band rushes, as I highlighted in the first lecture. The restrictions also typically lead to diversifying migration methods and migration routes. And as part of category jumping, it also increases the irregular character of migration, which can make migrants more vulnerable and exploitable. So, yes, restrictions do shape migration processes, but not necessarily in the way policymakers aim to do so. So there is a sort of second set of policy solutions to migration that policymakers have come up with. The idea of aid, like a Marshall Plan for Africa, or stimulating trade, or circular immigration as a sort of win-win-win strategy with benefits origin, destination countries, and migrants themselves, and where remittances and co-development are supposed to play a big role, or return migration, diaspora involvement, and this is all relevant to the theories we discussed in the third lecture on migration development, that development processes, either through aid, trade, circular migration, or return, will decrease the need for migration. Now, the underlying assumption is, is a theoretical one, which is development will lead to less migration. This is part of a more general casting of migration as development failure, which is very common, particularly in uh, developing uh, in, in sort of development, uh, people dealing with development issues and institutions de dealing with development issues, it tends to portray the primary cause of migration as poverty and human misery. Implicitly, these types of reasonings are founded upon theoretical assumptions, coming from neoclassical, place utility, and push-pull models. And the idea is, if we decrease the push, you will have less migration. Now, there's two problems. The first one is that these type of reasonings that we need to increase development, for instance, in Africa to reduce migration, it ignores labor demand-driven nature of migration. And in the first lecture, I highlighted the high degree of correlation between the business cycle and fluctuations in immigration. But the second more fundamental issue is the development and economic growth, whether this is achieved through aid, trade, remittances, or otherwise, is a substitute for migration, which is highly problematic. These so-called sedentary assumptions that immobility is a natural state, and as soon as we have development, we have less mobility and migration, is fundamentally problematic. And these views fail to see migration as an intrinsic part of development, rather than as a problem to be solved. And there is a set of theories, which I call transition theories, which can help us to understand the very complex systematic linkages between development and mobility, and particularly why we see in reality that development processes lead to the expansion of people's capabilities and aspirations and make it easier to move, generally lead to higher rates of mobility migration than lower, and may initially lead to the sort of takeoff emigration from poor countries, rather than reverse what is normally expected. There are two sets of theories in this field. They both conceptualize migration as a part of larger development processes. I will concentrate on the first set of theories. These are the long-term spatial temporal models, particularly developed by geographers like Zelinsky and Skeldon, but also worked by uh, histori economic historians like Hatton and Williamson have adapted this framework. And these theories observe regularities between parallel demographic and economic transitions on the one hand, and migration trends and patterns on the other, and generally postulate that development leads to higher overall levels of migration and mobility, which fundamentally upsets commonsensical ideas, which often inform policy. Migration hump theory is often confused with migration th transition theory, but it's a different set of theories. This has been pioneered by Martin and Taylor in 1996 uh, in response to the idea that the North Ar American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, would lead to less migration from Mexico to the United States. 
they actually uh, predicted the reverse, at least in the short to medium term, that increases in migration are more likely because freight reform will cause a lot of economic dislocations and the going bust of businesses and increase in unemployment, even if the long term impact would be positive, it, in the long shorter term it's rather going to lead to more migration. Now Zelinsky developed the initial idea of mobility transition theory. Now you really have to read the literature to, to, to gain a more fundamental understanding about these uh, sets of theories, but the basic issue is the following, that Zelinsky made a link between the different stages of what he called the vital transition in which he tried to expand demographic transition theory to broader changes, social and economic changes in society, which you can also summarize by developments or developmental stages with particular patterns in mobility. Now, and he distinguished pre-modern traditional societies, early transitional societies where mortality declines, fertility is still high and population growth peaks, the late transitional society where you see major declines of fertility but also a decelerating natural increase and the so-called advanced societies. He also distinguished the super advanced societies which is not distinguished in this graph. Now he linked these different phases to different patterns of mobility and migration. That in pre-modern societies migration and mobility would be relatively low and largely circular. That in early transitional societies all forms of mobility increase. And that in late transitional societies, international out-migration will decrease, rule to urban migration stagnates, and that in advanced societies we see an increase in residential mobility, urban to urban migration, but also we see migrant countries transforming from net immigration and migration countries, this is a typo, to net immigration countries. Now Ronald Skelton built upon this sort of set of theories and tried to make some more explicit links between the level of development, state formation on the one hand and population mobility on the, the, on the other. His central thesis was that where the level of development state formation are high, we often see integrated migration systems consisting of global and local movements, whereas they are low if migration systems are not integrated and mainly local. So again, it somehow presumes that with the development processes, migration increases overall. But we also see particular patterns. He distinguished the old and new core countries, which are generally characterized by immigration. So a high level of immigration relative to out-migration but also internal dis decentralization in the form of suburbanization processes. Then he defined an expanding core, let's say the BRICS, the upcoming nations, where we find both immigration and outmigration and internal centralization. So urbanization on the one hand, but also countries that still are labor expert countries, but increasingly become immigration countries. And perhaps Turkey is a prime example of such a country. Then he distinguished the labor frontier, which are the prime emigration countries, where we see both internal centralization, so growth of big cities and rural to urban migration, but very, very high levels of out migration. So these are the, the, the sort of classical emigration countries in Mexico, Morocco, until recently Turkey are prime examples of the sort of main labor exporting countries with often 10 or more percent of the populations living in, in other countries. Then a fifth sort of set of countries is what he called the resource niche. These are countries that are much more marginal, for instance parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, Central Asia and Latin America, with variable, often weaker forms of migration. So both theoretical perspectives presume that we are not expecting the highest migration levels to appear in the most marginal and least connected countries. It's rather that group of countries that are integrating in the global economy, that are developing infrastructure connections, but still have such high levels of relative poverty where the wage gaps and opportunity gaps with destinations are still quite large, but at the same time where people do have the resources to migrate. Mm -hmm. 
And bringing all these theories together, we could think about the following theoretical model, where processes of human development make a country or region overall more attractive, which explains that we expect to see more immigration the more a country becomes developed because it will offer more opportunities. But the surprise is in the other line, which is that development initially increases people's capabilities to move. It also, particularly education, increases people's aspirations to move. And infrastructure development also, of course, facilitates migration, which explains why these theories expect more emigration, at least in the short to medium term, later rather than less immigration. And of course, on the longer term, if a country shifts into the group of more developed countries, we can expect less people being willing to emigrate, but uh, still significant people, amounts of people will migrate, but less than before. And at some point, migration will shift from being countries of immigration to being countries uh, of migration of being countries of net immigration. Another fundamental assumption is that although emigration drops down after a certain level, it doesn't revert back to sort of pre-transition levels. And this is linked to the notion that highly developed societies are highly mobile more generally. For instance, emigration rates from wealthy countries like Britain or the Netherlands are actually rather high. Now, we do find quite a lot of empirical support for these type of theories. Support the idea of human development and parallel demographic transitions often lead to a diffusion of initially internal, so rural to migration, later international migration occurred across communities and nations, rather than the other way around. Why is that the case? Because development increases not only capabilities, so people's ability to move, for instance, because they have access to financial, social, or human resources, but very fundamentally and often ignored issue is that development through the exposure to new information and ideas and ideas about a good life through education and media and the exposure to tourists and, for instance, migrants tends to increase aspirations. The first structural factor is to develop societies have better infrastructure, but also, and this brings us back to the theories about segmented labor markets, that the more developed societies are, the higher their levels of education, the more complex and more segmented the labor markets tend to be. And the more high-skilled people are, the larger the geographical expense of the labor markets. And these are very powerful explanations why highly developed societies still have rather high levels of both internal and international migration. And this further upsets the very idea that development will decrease migration, rather we should state the other way around. Now, there is historical evidence for this. For instance, the economic historians Hatton and Williams, in a beautiful study of European migration to the US between 1850 and 1913, showed that emigration usually increased as wage rates in source and destination countries converged, which means that migration to the US initially took off in the sort of core countries the northwestern core countries of Europe, to start with Britain. It was not the poorest countries that sent most migrants to the United States. It was only later when other countries in Europe developed and uh, underwent fundamental transformations, for instance, the mechanization of um, um, agriculture and the, the growth of industries in big cities, that emigration to the Americas took off in those countries, for instance, Eastern Europe and later on Southern Europe. An additional explanation, besides the fact that those processes of development in those countries created a bigger population that was able and willing to migrate, is that initially it seems the paradox that we see development declining wage differentials and still increasing migration. But this can be explained by two factors. First of all, the mass arrival of cohorts of young workers on the labor market which is a result of past fertility. Because even if fertility goes down, which it often does in countries that develop rapidly, the initial effects will be a youth bulge. 
So we see less babies, but more people, let's say young adults, who are very prone to migrate, which is what every study shows. So we can ex expect in countries with a large youth belts, a large proportion of the population between, let's say, 18 and 30 years, having high migration rates. The second explanation is something we um, highlighted in the lecture on, on, on migration uh, networks, system formation, is that these dynamics decrease the cost and risk of migration, and they somehow counterbalance the theoretical effect that declining wage differentials should have on migration. Also, if we look at contemporary migration patterns in the world, we see that this theory is by and large confirmed. This study and this graph shows or uses uh, data from the World Bank on global migrant stocks. It basically shows which part of the population of every country is emigrants and immigrants. And what I did is to divide all countries in the world by their level of human development index. So I clustered very low, low, middle, high, and very high levels of development. And then I calculated what on average is the percentage of the population living abroad and the percentage of the population being immigrants. Now this is sustained by all sorts of regression analysis which are in the paper, but I'll just show you this graph to show the general pattern which the paper has found. Now looking at the red bars, they represent the percentage of the average percentage of the population of countries within each group that are immigrants. And here basically we see what we would expect, that the more developed a country, the more attractive it becomes. So from three, less than 3% of the population to about 15% on average of that population. The blue bars is the more interesting part and perhaps not so surprising anymore, but um, it shows a very, very clear pattern that middle-income countries, middle development countries with a medium level of human development are the prime emigration countries. And if you remember the graph in the lecture on migration development, these are also the countries that tend to receive mass remittances. So it all seems to fit together here. But what it very clearly shows that the whole assumption that development of the poorest countries, for instance in Sub-Saharan Africa, would be an effective medicine against migration is fundamentally flawed both on theoretical and empirical grounds. Now there are some reasons, very good reasons, to criticize these transition theories. First of all, as the classic new so the neoclassical and neo Marxist migration theories about the causes, there again this set of theories are rooted in this myth of the immobile peasant which is the erroneous idea that before the Industrial Revolution, people didn't move, and that the Industrial Revolution uprooted peasants from the stable communities for the first time. In effect, this was a romanticized, elitist view of peasant life, as Kelvin argued. And migration historians have convincingly showed that rates of migration and mobility in so-called pre-modern, pre-industrial Europe, but also elsewhere in the world, are actually rather high. But this is very important. Nevertheless, it would also be incorrect to assume that there has, has been no change. And perhaps we should say that rather than leading to more migration as such, that industrial revolution has changed the way in which people migrate. And this is particularly linked to the uh, process of urbanization, which had led to a sort of unprecedented movement from rural areas to urban areas. And Urbanization is the prime example of how it's difficult to disentangle migration and development. Because if you see urbanization and industrialization as one big meta process, you cannot think about this process without migration from rural areas to urban areas. And this is still ongoing in many countries in the world, like for instance China. But also the other way around. It's very difficult to think about rural to urban migration without considering the process of industrial growth cluster of economic activities in cities um, and, and urbanization overall. So there seems to be something new about new migration, but there's a big danger of thinking that migration as such is new or to become 
from a sort of sedentary past. Another danger is the sort of Eurocentric and teleological nature of these theories, which seems to assume there is one single and unilinear path towards development where all countries will go through. And it's also, and it's a Eurocentrism, that we expect other areas in the world, developing countries, to go through similar processes. It's dangerous to assume that these transitions, these migration transitions, will evolve in the same way as they happened in the past in Europe and North America. Taking this on board, there still seems to be a clear pattern, but of course it will be very dangerous and difficult to exactly predict about the future, but some statements can be derived with a bit more confidence, like for instance, it would be somehow naive to assume that more development will necessarily lead to less migration, particularly for the poorest countries. We can be more certain that the reverse is more likely. Another danger is so-called demographic determinism, because most of these theories create a link between demographic transitions and migration, and this is linked to sort of Malthusian ideas about high population growth leading to more migration. As I've highlighted in the first lecture, this is not necessarily the case. The examples of Eastern Europe with low fertility, low growth, some negative growth, and often high upmigration, and the Gulf states with high demographic growth and low upmigration are prime examples of how we should never make a direct link between demographic processes and migration. Because how demographic change affects migration is fundamentally affected by its interaction with, for instance, economic development. A last big problem is the idea that, and this is linked to the critique on the sort of determinism of these theories, is that migration transitions are reversible, they're not inevitable. Because if a decrease in development level relative to other countries affects the country, we might also expect reverse transitions. So we see immigration countries re-becoming emigration countries. And this is perhaps what we have recently seen in Portugal, which is a country that over the 1980s and 90s started to attract more and more immigrants, but now again seems to be um, um, the source of many new migrants who, for instance, go to Brazil or African countries like Angola. So, and in the past we've seen similar issues like, for instance, during the economic crisis in Argentina. So we shouldn't just assume that all countries will go through this phase and never come back. Um, and that's another sort of part of this teleological nature of those theories, that assume there's one unilinear path towards development, which would be a dangerous assumption to make. So what lessons can we draw from transition theories and from the insights the empirical research yields? First, the relationship between development and net emigration is neither linear nor inversely proportional. And that generally we can say that social and economic development is associated with increased mobility and migration because it increases people's capability and aspirations to migrate. The latter, the aspirations part, is very important and is also a useful way to include sort of non-economic theories in order to understand why migration, migration, development often leads to more migration because it changes people's aspirations. Education and access to new sources of information and ideas about what the good life is about will inevitably change people's life aspirations. Take an example of a peasant community. I did research in, in southern Morocco, youngsters who once they went to school didn't aspire to become peasants as their fathers, even if they had enough land. They aspired different lifestyles. They wanted to become their own bosses or lawyers or pick up good jobs in the city. They changed their perspective on life. So this is another reason why development broadly defined increases migration aspirations. And initially in development processes, both increasing capabilities and aspirations can explain the rapid increase of migration. I think this set of theories also highlights the complementarities with theories on the perpetuation of migration. Because within this broader process, it can also ex help to explain why migration gains its own momentum due to internal processes. So once migration has been set in motion, 
networks, systems, remittances tend to further increase people's capability and aspirations to migrate. As we have highlighted in the lecture on internal migration processes, it affects the broader context. It can lead to uh, making migration less riskily and costly, but it can also increase wealth deprivation. It can help people to cost migration. It can also um, lead to business formation in uh, destination countries, which then attract more migrants, so everything starts to become intertwined. And this amalgamate of processes increases capabilities, relative deprivation and aspirations, which tend to reinforce each other and can explain accelerating migration, even if countries develop rapidly and if wage and opportunity gaps decrease rapidly. Only after income gaps narrow significantly and network disintegrate, emigration tends to decrease and immigration to increase, after which countries tend to become, tend to, do become net immigration countries. And this is what we have recently seen in the case of Turkey, which now receives more migrants and actually sends migrants. And perhaps this is a process that one might expect to see happening in Mexico. A bit a bit more in the past, uh, for instance, Southern Europe has re witnessed this huge transition. Countries like Spain and Italy have transformed from prime labor exporters to main immigration poles. Although the current global crisis and economic crisis might once again change their position on the international migration map, highlighting the fact that migration transitions are potentially reversible. reversible. What are the policy implications to wrap this whole lecture series up in a way? Because we have now hopefully accumulated some key insights into what causes migration, what explains the continuation of migration, and how is migration interconnected with broader processes of development, social transformation, and globalization. First of all, what I stressed in the beginning is we really need to reconceptualize migration as an intrinsic part of broader development processes rather than a problem to be solved. And it's fundamentally upset commonsensical perspectives of migration, both in research and policy. Second is the insight that processes of development and globalization increase capabilities, aspirations, and people's opportunities to migrate. And that we do see the development processes, however we define them, are linked to particular migration patterns but generally we see increased mobility. And to some extent, increased migration as well. Takeoff development in the least developed countries is quite likely to lead to takeoff migration because it will increase people's capabilities, aspirations, and opportunities to migrate. And from there, if we think about migration policy, perhaps the focus has been too much on migration policy. Because if we think about the big drivers of migration, which are political, economic, and social in nature, and which are linked to these big processes of development and globalization, we also need to think about other policies if we think about what really affects migration. Migration policies seem to have some effect, but a very limited effect, because they don't reach beyond. They cannot really affect a broad trends which are factors that affect migration. So in a way, if we think about policy, thinking about these theoretical frameworks, if policymakers and politicians want to affect migration, they also need to look at other policies, like more general economic and trade policies. But for instance, economic protectionism and decreasing trade, taking on board transition theories and migration system theory is likely to reduce also migration. The same goes for foreign direct investment. More generally, increased economic closeness will probably help to reduce migration. And of course, the other way around. And this is what we've seen, that increasing economic liberalization has gone along with increasing migration. So the aim to liberalize economic processes and labor market on the one hand, and the public aim to decrease migration seem to be incongruent. Other measures you can think about is, for instance, tightly regulate labor markets. Uh, Western countries have liberalized labor markets, which, and have also privatized former public services, which, for instance, in the postal services, 
have led to the dismissal of people who had semi-permanent um, or permanent jobs in that sector and have been replaced by temporary workers who are often migrants. And there are many other examples of sectors where labor has become more casual and hence the increased uh, labor demand for migrants. And last but not least, the most effective way seems to be to reduce levels of human development, which will make countries less attractive for migrants. Obviously, this is not uh, an aim of any government in the world, but I think it's a very important reminder to not to be very naive about the extent to which policies can actually affect broader long-term patterns of migration. I hope that this lecture series has been uh, useful in, as a sort of primer to highlight the key issues. Unfortunately, these lectures are too short to go into full theoretical depth. And I hoped that the issues highlighted in this lecture series will encourage you to, to go deeper into the literature and read more about these theories. And particularly, I hope it has highlighted that theory is not a boring topic, it is a highly relevant topic. It really helps us to understand the many facets of migration and will also help us to better understand what policies can and cannot achieve.